Well, I just want to welcome everyone to our Zoom end of life talk series. Um, I know this is a difficult topic for many, and so we're just really glad that you've come to share this space and be with us tonight. Um, I'm Lisa Falk. For those of you who don't know, I'm head of community engagement for the Arizona State Museum. And as many of you know, the museum is part of the University of Arizona, and we're located in Tucson. We're situated on land that has been home to indigenous people for 13,000 years. Today, the Tucson area is home to the Atum and Pasco Yaqui, and there are 22 federally recognized tribes with reservation lands in the state of Arizona. While the museum's collections and research focus on the indigenous people of the Southwest US and Northwest Mexico, we do present programs exploring the diverse history and cultures of the region. And last fall, we opened the exhibit, Walking Each Other Home, Cultural Practices at the End of Life. We created the exhibit in partnership with the Southwest Folklife Alliance, and the co-curators was Kimi Isel, who's here tonight, Leah Moss, and myself. And as a member of the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership Program, over the last six years, the Southwest Folklife Alliance conducted research on end of life traditions, the ways we plan for and participate in end of life rituals and how we mourn and honor those who have passed on. And you'll see the results of that, um, of their research in the exhibit. And as I mentioned before, Kathleen Dreyer, who's here, she photographed many of the caretakers and, and, and activities processions, things that go on in Tucson that are included in the exhibit. So thank you, Kathleen. Um, together, the Southwest Folklife um, Alliance and the Arizona State Museum plan these related Zoom programs. We had one last week and the next one is on February 21st is about planning for death, such as filling out an advanced care directive. We want to thank the Arizona Humanities for support of these programs. And right at this point, I'm happy to welcome tonight's moderator, who will later introduce the panelist. Kimmy Isell is a folklorist and writer. At the Southwest Folklife Alliance, she manages communications, edits Border Lore, a monthly journal of cultural and heritage in the borderlands, and teaches ethnographic methods and writing in community. She co-curated Walking Each Other Home, Cultural Traditions at the End of Life, and programs related to end of life, grief, and musical memory traditions at the last two Tucson Meet Yourself festivals. So without further ado, Kimmy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. I forgot about the Tucson Meet Yourself work for a minute, thanks. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. Uh, it's such an honor to sit here with these um, beautiful folks that you're gonna hear from. Uh, I just wanna say a little bit about this, um, the project that we're going to be reflecting on um, as well as the life stories. And so, uh, at some point, right as the pandemic was breaking out or just before then, um, we at the Folklife Alliance decided that one of the ways we wanted to honor and look at end of life customs and traditions amongst the many ways that you'll see um, in that exhibit was to look at the work of caregivers. And so in folk life, this is called um, occupational folk life. What does it mean to be in the culture of this kind of work? Um, what are the practices and methods of being an end of life caregiver at home? And so um, we were fortunate to be funded by the End of Life Care Partnership and the David and Laura Lovell Foundation to undergo um, a year long, very interesting um, study, uh, research, documentation. And so the, that project for that project, we paired an ethnographer someone who studies culture, um, someone who is versed in interviewing and, and with um, an end of life home caregiver. And so we had five pairs and we spent some time um, doing some training for the ethnographers. Some of them had lots of experience in ethnography like Amalia here that you'll meet in a moment. And some were very new to that work what it means to listen and um, understand someone else's life and then document it. So of course this research was carried out during the pandemic. So it meant that the ethnographers and the caregivers did a lot of their conversations via phone and Zoom until it was safe for them to meet in person. Um, but what I witnessed over the year of that research, I met monthly with the ethnographers. So I heard them every month talk about these unfolding relationships with their, with the caregivers that they were interviewing. And I witnessed just such a, a, a beautiful series of relationships unfold um, 
and the stories that the caregivers were telling the ethnographers that the ethnographers were then telling me um, and then which I went on to read in their written ethnographies are just remarkable stories of of remarkable people who do work that is often very invisible um, and hidden. And so part of what we do in folk life is we like to bring things that are hidden in plain view um, into view. And so those ethnographies will be completed this spring, uh, available to the public. You can also view some of them uh, you can listen to some of the snippets of those interviews online um, on the Southwest Folklife website. So um, I just wanted to contextualize that, that that, that project, um, our aim was really to uplift the work of caregivers. And so tonight's program is a continuation of that, recognizing the dignity and care um, of those workers. And then now to learn a little bit about what that work means. So I want to introduce our three speakers, um, panelists this evening, and we're hope, we hope to have a conversation with, with each other and then with you about this um, incredible work and, and then to shed light on um, what, care, what this kind of caregiving means for all of you. And so with us tonight, we have Deborah Young, uh, one of the participants in the ethnography. Um, she has been a caregiver for almost, uh, end of life caregiver for almost 20 years. And she lives here in Tucson, and you're going to hear a lot from her this evening. She works for a local agency, um, so she is uh, um, she is a professional. And then um, Kim Shea comes to us. Um, she's a clinical professor in the University of Arizona College of Nursing. She has a 15-year clinical practice in hospice and a research program in palliative care. And Kim um, was not part of our ethnographic study, but she comes to us tonight with valuable expertise and stories from her own practice, as well as from her work training and working in, in research with other nurses. So we're really happy to have you here, Kim. And then um, Amalia Mora um, is uh, one of the project ethnographers who was paired with Deborah Young. And so they developed a relationship over the course of the year of research. Um, Amalia is um, an ethnographer, an ethnomusicologist. Um, her work looks at the intersection of performing arts and human rights. She is um, a lecturer at, at the U of A human rights practice program. And she just has started a new position at the University of California, um, UCLA, and with a new initiative to study hate. So um, welcome to all three of you. Um, so happy you're here. Nice to so, be here. I wanted to just start off um, with you, Deb, and just Hi. ask you to talk a little bit about the kind of caregiving work you do and how you got into it. Basically, I do hospice uh, caregiving and like regular caregiving for people, um, seniors that um, want to stay at home. And a lot of them don't have family. A lot of them do have family but need help in the home. Um, need help taking them to doctor's appointments and um, talking to their doctors and talking to them and talking to their family and making sure that they're not alone. So, yeah, and I started, I think it found me. I didn't find it, it found me. But it started with my with my mom. I really got into it with my mom when she passed. I had to sit with her. And all through college, um, I always did it all through college. But then after I retired, I started doing it full time. Um, so it became a part of me. I don't look at it as a job anymore. It's just something that found me and I found it. So we found each other. Yeah. And I know that you work, you mentioned that, and I know this from your ethnography, that you work mostly with um, folks who don't necessarily have family caregivers or folks who are living alone or have been alone. And how, yeah. how do you end up in that particular slice of this work? Um, it's kind of hard, kind of sad, but it's rewarding because you have people who's alone, who don't have any family, um, whether they're distant from their family or whether they're the last ones left. And, you know, is they think that they're alone, but we're there to help them and let them know that they're not alone, that there's somebody who really cares for them, who, who's concerned about them, really, really concerned about them and not just there for a dollar, but there to hear them, to help them to 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 help them with their wishes and um the things that they need to be done not putting ourselves on them 
but taking on um, the things that they can do for themselves to help them out. Yeah. And Kim, um, how about you? Can you talk to us a little bit about how you came to end of life caregiving? Yeah, um, I was a nurse. Um, I still am a nurse. <laughs> and um, I never really was interested in being in the hospital as a nurse, but I really wanted to be in the community and working with community people. Um, and I remember when I got my, I worked in home health, but I, when I got the job at hospice, I, I thought it was, you know, the best thing ever. I was so excited. And I think I was drawn to it because uh, my mom died when I was nine. And so there was that effort to try and figure out what all this was about and kind of, you know, be really from an intellectual perspective, I think I was drawn to it. But um, as I started the work, I, I just, I loved what it provided for me, uh, a feeling of, of service and a feeling of helping people um, in that last phase of, of their life. And, um, you know, if you're a kind of person that likes to help others, I can't think of a better place to be. Beautiful. Can you talk a little bit about the work you do now, too, in research and with the nurses? Oh, sure. I could talk all day on that. So you might want to <laughs> tell me to stop. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the work I, I, I do now is um, very um, involved with teaching others. Um, I work at the College of Nursing. Um, when I, after I worked in hospice for many years, I did get burned out. And I, we can talk about that later as some of the challenges faced with um, being a caregiver um, and, and in the role of a case manager, which is what there is called the nurse that goes from home to home in hospice. Um, because they don't stay there for the whole day like Deb might do. Um, they go in and manage um, components and work with the caregivers that are there to um, help the person who has a serious illness and, and is at end of life. Um, but um, I, I did that for many years and then I got burned out and I had to get away from it. So consequently, I, I went back to school and that's what led me into academia, where I um, now teach um, in a palliative care class. Although, you know, we have some excellent educators in palliative care who are out in the community, who are palliative care providers, both in the hospital and in uh, private clinical practice. Uh, so we all work together um, to help our students. And I also work in my research is in telehealth because at that point of burnout, I studied informatics, <laughs> which is technology. And that shows you how far you can knee jerk when you uh, need to get away from burnout. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I combine them to do telehealth for people who are in their home, not able to get into doctors or to see others or their providers, and they can use telehealth to do those visits. And then Amalia, hi, um, do you wanna talk a little bit about your role in this um, ethnographic project and what drew you to it? Well, my role was really um, just it was so easy this work because Deb was just is just such a great storyteller and just such a wonderful human being and so really my my job was just to listen to her stories and so I I spent um over the course of a year and a half several conversations a lot of time just talking about her process her life story her insight her wisdom and then finally, again, it was so easy to just bring all of uh, what she said together into sort of a cohesive narrative and, and story and piece that um, ended up being uh, the ethnography that I wrote. What drew me to this work was, um, you know, I, I do a lot of research on um, music and dance and performance. When people think of dance, they think of it as something that very fit, healthy bodies uh, are engaged in. I, and I think that 
there is a kind of cultural obsession with youth and strength and fitness that has a lot to do with our you know, socioeconomic system and what we value in society. And I started becoming really interested in how dance and movement might not serve this cultural obsession, but might instead serve those whose lives or bodies are at the end of life, whose lives and bodies are not as fit or healthy. And how that might be, how dance and movement might be a healing experience. And so coincidentally, I was in conversation with this woman who does dance movement therapy for um, those who are at the end of life, not necessarily dance, but just movement therapy. And that was when this opportunity arose. And I thought I have to apply to this because um, I was so fascinated in just thinking about the body and its movements and how end of life caregivers learn to understand those movements as a kind of choreography. And so that that just drew me to this. I think that, you know, again, really, I think we we draw so much of our of our daily of our daily lives are um, you know, again, this sort of this cultural obsession with being healthy, being fit, being young. And I think that really I was interested in learning you know, wisdom from those who who are working with those whose bodies are at the other end of that spectrum. I remember um, there's a moment that that you brought to the ethnographic team, and that is also reflected in the ethnography. That for those of you, these the ethnographies are not um, they're not they haven't finished being designed by the designer, but they will be um, available to you um, later on in the spring. But there was there's a moment in which you discover that Deb is learning. Um, she the, some one of the ways she works with her clients is non-verbally, and so I don't know if you you or Deb or both of you just want to take a little minute to talk about that. Um, how you read the body to know what people want or need. I think that everybody's different, but. It's the way they look, it's the way they sound, it's their body language, their movement. Um, I have a lot of clients that don't are not verbal and their eyes, their movement, their touch, their, you know, just the little sounds that they make. Um, and if you pay close attention to it, you'll know their needs. You know, they don't always have to speak their need, but um, they do it emotionally. You know, even if you don't, if you can't talk verbally, you can talk emotionally, you can move your hands, you can bet your eye, it's just the movement in it. And I think that a lot now that I zoom in on the body language because that is so important because it's not what they're saying, but it's what they're not saying. That's important to me. Um, a lot of times they'll say that they're feeling good, but when I look at them, I know that they're not feeling good. Um, by their body language, by their eyes, by their movement, by the moans. Um, so it's, it's a, a, to me, I think the most important thing is noticing the body language, noticing the movement, getting to know them, getting to know their actions, getting to know what they're not saying. And I think that's more important. The silent word that they're not speaking is so important and it speaks louder than words. Kim, I wanted to turn to you to just help us. What do we mean by end of life care? And I just want to also jump into that kind of complicated question of the difference between palliative care and hospice, just to kind of set the scene for us moving forward. Yeah, isn't it interesting? Um, you know, I started this work in 1990. And at that time, we really didn't use the word palliative, we used pre hospice, which was a really bizarre term, but um, nobody wanted to be in pre hospice. Um, but I it, it palliative started to be a word that was used more frequently around in the in 2000. And I think as I think about it, we've been trying for so many years to clear up. And when I talk about that, we I'm talking about the people who are involved in this type of care, who go out and talk to families, talk to patients about the difference between palliative care and hospice. And the reason I think that it is so confusing to people is that we have a definition in this country that is different and from other countries. And, and when I say that, we get confused because we think hospice is a place. We think hospice is a place you go to 
and you stay there until you die. Um, and because that's it, it is that in some countries, but in this country, that's not what it is. The hospice program is a program that has is established and it has funding for the services, Medicare and private insurance. And what they do is they put a lot of resources to enable you to stay at home and to die and have a wonderful death if as much as possible with loved ones around at home. That is the focus of hospice. Sometimes we can't control the symptoms and sometimes the caregivers um, are so challenged that it, there's a need for the patient to go to a facility. And that's what the inpatient hospice is. 3% of all patients that receive the hospice benefit that is paying for their services to go to their home, for their supplies, a hospital bed, somebody to go in and help bathe. Um, so many services are covered by hospice, but only 3% of the people in that program are inpatient. The other 97% are in their home, whatever their home is. So their home can be in a nursing home. Their home can be in an adult living facility, or it can be in their residence. So that's hospice. Palliative care is care that is the focus of interventions, things we can do to help make people more comfortable to make, to control symptoms, to control um, things that are resulting from a serious illness. Um, and one of the things that gets very confused is the reason you go into hospice is a doctor thinks that you have less than six months to live. It's a prognosis. They don't have to be right. They can be wrong. But that's what they say and they think. And so that is the kind of key that turns on, that opens the door for you to go into hospice. That's six month time. For palliative care, you can receive palliative care, which is somebody who is specialized in symptom management. And those symptoms can be a result of the, the disease process, or those symptoms can be a result of the treatment you're receiving, but it helps you to cope. It helps you to be comfortable. And those services from palliative care come from a specialist who can deliver that type of care and who studies that type of care. And you can receive palliative care in addition to any kind of other intervention any kind of aggressive chemotherapy, anything to alleviate your disease, you can receive palliative care in, a, in, in addition to that. Unlike hospice where you have pretty much said, I'm, I'm tired of all this aggressiveness. I'm tired of all things that are being done to try and cure my disease. I want to be just content, content in living out the rest of my life. And that's a decision that you make with your provider who then says, yes, I believe you to have less than six months to live. And therefore, all of the benefits of a hospice program open up to you. So I don't, I think that's enough to say. I mean, I, I, I could go on a long time, but in other countries, that's not the case. Um, and in other cultures, um, and I've had students come from countries that are predominantly Buddhist and they are hospice nurses and what they do is is uh, palliative care they they don't they take um, food to the Buddhist temple for the patients they don't do what we define as hospice here so it it gets confused when you take it out of this country mm -hmm. Thank you. Deb, did you want to add anything to that? I, no, I liked everything that she was saying. And, and it's so true that um, 
that we all have to work together. And there's a lot of clients that rather be at home, rather be comfortable um, and not in a hospital, not in a facility. Um, and it's, it's up to the caregiver to help them to help them um, to, to, to bring their wishes to, to pass, to whatever they want to do, whatever they like to do, you know, um, seeing that they're comfortable, seeing that, that, you know, if it's just sometimes just holding their hands, you know, just hold, I'm, I'm not lying, I'm saying, would you hold my hands to her? You know, I'll sit there, I'll sing to them, I'll hold their hands, I'll laugh, I'll tell a joke. I mean, it's important. It is so, so important and to know what they want and to help follow out their, their, what, what it is that they want their wishes. That I mean, I think that's a big one is not to throw things on them, but to find out what they want. You know, what do you want? What do you expect? Do you expect for me to rub your feet? <laughs> you know, without you saying anything, do you want me to rub your shoulder? Do you, you know, what is it that you want? And I think that's so important because it lets us know that, um, if I have a need, I want somebody to attend to my needs, you know, whether I speak it out loud or whether I write it down. So my thing is like, help me to, to bring forth my wishes and the things that I need to, to have a peaceful end. Yeah. You know, and I loved what Deb said about reading uh, the patient and reading their body language and not having mm -hmm. to have them have to say, and, you know, because sometimes their energy is so low and, you know, just being able to bring that thought out is exhausting. And yes. um, that is one of the hardest things to teach people mm -hmm. is how to be quiet yes. and read and just be there and learn from your patient in, in quietness as well as learn who they are so that you can read their body language. You can read their little subtle um, eye movements, you know, <laughs> things that they're doing. Um, yeah. and, and that's what's so wonderful about having somebody that goes there consistently as a caregiver. You know, like Deb was saying, she has clients that she spends time with she gets to know them. She gets to know their idiosyncrasies, their movements. Family members know this about their patients, but it's hard to teach professionals who go in and do um, one visit at a time. That's a really, because it's not something you can teach. It's yeah, that's true. Feel, you know? Yeah. This, and to this, piggyback off of that, I really don't think that um, like you have a lot of caregivers that, that are really good caregivers, but that might not be their area of expertise. So I think that is so important to have the right people around, somebody who has the empathy, somebody who has the patience, somebody who cares. I, don't, I get choked up every time I talk about it. <laughs> somebody who cares, somebody who don't mind being there. Some, you know, I don't, you can't look at it as a job. You got to look at it as I want to help this person. I want to help your needs. And then you look at yourself. What do I want? You know, it makes me, it makes me look at to think about how I want to go. It makes me think about how, if, if it's my time to be in hospital, what I want done, you know? And so I just write a lot because I'm learning so much from them. You know, they think that I'm helping them, but they're really helping me. You know, we're helping each other because they're helping me to learn more about myself more about my needs, more about what I need, you know? So I, mean, I think it's really important to have the right people for the right job. You know, and I think that also um, kind of rolls into realizing, and I can only imagine, I have never worked with Deb, but how wonderful she is with this because there is so much control that they have lost. Mm -hmm. So much that they they have to have other people do for them yes. that to have a person who's there just for you and you know not that they have control over you right. but that they you you as the caregiver are there strictly for them you know right. you're there for them and their needs and they don't have to expend a lot of energy telling you what to do but they also know you are there for them and they have 
that one little bit of control left, you know, yes. one little bit of thing that, that, that is theirs. I, I don't know how else to describe it, but. No, that's, that's true. Um, you know, sometimes I think that um, when I watch my clients sometimes, it's like, if you can sit up on your own, I'll let you sit up on your own. It's just like, whatever you can do, I want you to do it. Whatever you can't do, I can do the rest for you. You know, just giving them that much, like you still have that in you to do it. You still have that in you to sit up. You still have that in you to put your shoes on. If it's in you to do it and you can do it, then I'm going to be right there with you, but I'm going to let you do it. You know, because you don't want to take everything from them and like you're a bad wreck and that's the end of it. No, if you can do it, then go ahead and do it. And I'm, I'm all for it. You know, I'm all for it. That gives me goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, it makes me cry. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. You are, you're you're both already answering my next question, which is, um, you know, what makes a good end of life caregiver? You're already talking about that. But I know that, Deb, there are some other things that you have brought to your clients um, over the years, sort of this notion of getting unstuck. I think that over I think that over the years I've come to sit with people and you know, they always some will be afraid and I'll talk to them and, you know, and, and a lot of anger comes out, you know, a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness comes out, a lot of weariness. And I would always ask them, so if you could go back and do one thing, what would it be? And a lot of them said, I would have my family here. I will forgive my family, you know, and I talk to them about forgiveness, how important it is to forgive, you know, how important it is just to let go, you know, and just don't let it linger long. And a lot of them may take a couple of days, but they say, you know what, Deb? I'm going to forgive my daughter. I'm going to forgive my son. It doesn't even matter no more. I'm going to love them and just hope that they love me, you know? So, I mean, it's so important not to hold on to the anger, to the hold on to the bitterness, to hold on to the envy, to hold on to the things of the past that you don't even remember why it happened. So I talk to them a lot about that. And I always ask them, you know, if they believe in God or did you make your peace with God? And, you know, just to just to get them some peace, because a lot of them don't have peace. They don't know what peace is, you know, and I sit with them. I just talk to them and just let them feel free to explain to me how they feel, you know, and I, I'll just help them. You know, I think that is so, so, so important because we in this life, we hold on to bitterness. We don't want to die with bitterness. You know, we don't we don't want to hold on to it in this world. and then. When it's time for us to go, we don't want to hold on to it going out of this world. You know, we got to let it go. It frees us, you know, to get to set them free so that they can have that peace. And they won't have that peace if they have that bitterness and anger with them. You know, I'm sorry, y'all. But the I goal, said I like, wasn't you know, going to cry. It's, it's, well, <laughs> the, what you do is give them a gift of helping them to let go. Yes. Because, you know, it's so hard to let go when you're not at peace. You know, yes. it's just it's just something inside of us that keeps us living. And and you know, and when you're so so close to the end of life, and and you know, to stay here and keep mm -hmm. staying here because you haven't completed something, and you don't. There have you go. It. Yes. Yes. You know. Yes. That's yes. beautiful, Deb. That's really nice. You know, and it's funny because I see a lot of them that when they finally do let go and say, I forgive and you know what, it's over and I'm going to let it go. And I just want to call them and tell them I love them. It's just like after that, it's just like it's mainly over. I see a lot of them just go to sleep, you know, and I'm like, wow, they was holding on all this long time. You know, because we carry bitterness around when we ain't sick and it, it, it makes us sick. You know, unforgiveness makes us sick within ourselves. You know, not letting these things go, not telling people, you know, it's OK. You know, I might not agree with you, but it's OK. You know, and, and that's where I do. I'm like, it's OK. You know, it's OK. You're going to make your peace. You're going to do, you know, you're going to feel good about yourself. And it's OK. And a lot of them say, you know what? I never felt this piece before I've always carried this around and and they say you're sitting on your deathbed all you have to do is think about your think about your past and all the things that you've done and all the things that you want to do and most people say is the the unforgiveness that they can't get over you know so I'm there to help them with that beautiful 
I mean, these are really lessons for living. <laughs> yeah. You know, and when Deb said she gets so much from her patients, I can so resonate with that because having been in this type of work and this, I feel that I, I can live better, you know, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. you just, you learn not to sweat the small stuff, you know, yes. and, and it just changes your life, even though it's hard work hard. and it causes yes. you to cry so much and struggle, mm -hmm. but ultimately your life is, is, is better for it. And that's exactly. a gift that we get. Exactly. I like exactly. You said you hit it on the nail. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So um, thanks for, for that, Deb and Kim. And I just want to turn to Amalia now, because what, what I'm hearing is um, like that, that these relationships that you have with people at end of life, there is something that's very resonant. Um, for the folklorist and ethnographer, not just um, you know in documenting the work, but in the practice of doing that, the sitting with, the listening, the observing, the paying yeah. attention to details, to noticing body language, that the, the two forms of work have a lot of alignment. And um, even though folklorists and ethnographers aren't always you know, or, or often are not dealing with people at end of life, there are some, there's some overlap. And I just have to say that the, the, the five women, um, some of whom are, are in the audience this evening, the five women who documented the lives of caregivers brought mm -hmm. that kind of care. And I could see that the, the kind of care that their caregivers were offering was also rubbing off on them in the way that they were um, approaching their work. So that was just, it was really beautiful to see the way that this ripples out. But anyway, I wanted to turn to Amalia because in, in her writing of, um, writing up of Deb's life, she, she landed on this really beautiful phrase um, as a way of understanding what this work is about. And so I want to really give Amalia a chance to talk about that. So what, one of the things that, um, that, um, you know, we, we, are, we were all, all of the ethnographers were paired with different kinds of caregivers, um, some of whom were caregiving for their family members, others who were professional, like, like Deb, although as she beautifully stated, it's, it's not just a profession, it's, it's a mission, it's a life mission, and it's a beautiful one. But one of the things that, that struck me from the beginning was that I know, I knew that Deb worked with um, a lot of clients who were alone. And as she mentioned, some were alone because they just had families out of state or they had passed. Others, however, uh, were estranged from their families. She talked to me a lot about the estrangement. And I kind I wondered, you know, why do you why do you think there's so many people who um end up alone? One thing that that was a recurring theme that she talked about was the way in which money, either having it or not having it, yeah. makes us estranged from those people that we that we love the most. And sort of how our society's emphasis on the importance of wealth and money, the impact that that has on our interpersonal relationships. And it, I remember thinking as she was talking, you know, the wealthy are told you have to be everything mm -hmm. and they believe they have to be everything. And that leads to resentment and interpersonal problems. And the and people who are poor are told you're nothing and they believe they're nothing and they get stuck, yeah. as Deb says, in that nothingness. And that leads to personal interpersonal problems. And ultimately, at both ends of the spectrum, ultimately leads to the potential for a lonely passing or a lonely end of life. Yeah. And so I, as I was um, thinking about it, I thought I was thinking a lot about precariousness and the fragility or precariousness of interpersonal relationships that Deb gave so much interesting insight into. And I ended up um, borrowing in my ethnography from a phrase actually that was um, written by film, these film theor theorists, um, Maria Stell, Stell and Beverly Weber. Um, and they were actually analyzing um, 21st century uh, European um, cinematic portrayals of the refugee experience. And they use this concept of precarious intimacy um, to describe how um, regimes 
or the way that regimes of race, racist exclusions continue to render or make social bonds within refugees communities impermanent. And that what could become lasting relationships end up instead to just be what sh- what they call fleeting potentialities. These hmm. potentials for beautiful interpersonal experiences that are broken, these bonds that can never be formed. And so here in re- relationship to Deb's work um, and the end of life caregiving that she does, I thought about how um, I, I, I use this phrase in my ethnography to describe how um, our profit and, and competition driven society mm-hmm. and, and socioeconomic system are helping to engender or create these precarious intimacies. And so obviously it's, it's this emphasis again on, on the importance of individual success, individual comfort that is rendering ultimately people's lives at the end of their life, these bonds are fragile, they're rendering them insecure and precarious. But what was also interesting to me is that Deb, also we talked about the precariousness of the relationship between the caregiver and the client because of the caregiving industry sometimes and its interest in cutting costs. Mm-hmm. And, and so more and more caregivers are less able to sometimes spend as much time, the time that it takes to get to know these these um, nonverbal ways of communicating, yes. right? And so not only are interpersonal relationships then on a familial level being severed, but also the relationships between caregiver, the intimacies between caregiver and client are being rendered precarious as well because of an increasingly profit-driven industry. Yes. And so that that was how I kind of saw these parallels, right? And so right at the moment when these clients who already have interpersonal bonds that are broken, right at the moment when they need a caregiver the most, they're not able to form and trust that bond yes. because there's shorter shifts, as you know, we talked about. And so the client is given less agency, the caregivers are given less agency. And that was something that, you know, that I, that I, um, and that was, that was where I I borrowed from that term. Such a beautiful way of um, thinking about it and understanding it. Kim, did you want to add something or say? Well, you know, I, I could talk a lot. I just wanted to add, because something really popped in my mind about my experience towards the And uh, so I went to a different hospice because the hospice I worked for in Tucson was um, Carondelet, was bought out by a a company that no longer provided care for that hospice. And this was a a much more uh, profit-driven hospice than than a mission or a nonprofit. And so what I can relate to what you're saying that made me not be able to stay with that program is that we had to record when we went in to the the facility the room or the hot the home but push a button say we have walked into the home and then push a button to say we're done and that was recorded on our ipad that we had and i had never done anything like that account for every second and you're so right because it it's about you know how much time is this nurse case manager spending in the house that we're paying her for um and and I couldn't do my job yeah. being under the clock like that I couldn't I I, I I couldn't even focus knowing I was the clock was ticking I mean that was a horrible feeling knowing that if I spent too much time I was going to have to justify it Mm-hmm. And so I I have never heard it put like you put it before, but I'm really impressed. I'm just fascinated by that concept when you put it in an ethnographer's perspective. It's really something to um, that what these ethnographers were able to do was to sort of look at somebody's work life from a particular vantage point, right? From having heard um, stories and listened over hours. Um, but there's an ability to kind of 
to, to pan out or pull back and sort of see um, the context. And so I know that, you know, we, earlier we were talking about, you know, what makes a good caregiver, what, what qualities um, Deb and Kim, you know, have brought to their work and seen others bring, but, but there's so many challenges and the, the caregivers that, that we interviewed for this project, you know, there are, they're beyond just somebody's health there are larger structural challenges, um, the commerce of it, the time shifts, the pay, the, a beautiful caregiver um, who had come here as a refugee and worked as a caregiver and was a very gifted caregiver, you know, ultimately left the work and, you know, because he, he wasn't getting paid enough. And, um, you know, other caregivers who struggle with, um, you know, with addiction problems because of how difficult their, their lives are. Um, because of some of these external challenges. So I just want to, you know, bring bring light to that. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to dive too into that, you know, to, before we turn it over to the to the audience here in a few minutes, but I did want to um, ask Kim and Deb to talk a little bit about some of those um, challenges that they experience, you know, less so the interpersonal, but um, some of the larger structural challenges. Um, I think one of the biggest ones for me is, like you said, not having a consistent caregiver there because it seems like it interrupts the client's trust because you have a caregiver that's been there for three months and all of a sudden we get uprooted and then the client has to bring a new person back in the home and get to know them all over. It's like a vicious cycle. So I think stability is number one to me stability with the client if you're there you're there and I, I think sometimes I tell them look I don't care if I'm on the clock you know I will do this anyway if you need me I will do it anyway because it's so important with the stability knowing that somebody's there knowing that somebody knows you knowing that somebody cares for you I mean to the end I mean I'm in it I'm in it to the end you know and I know that not everybody's that way but I'm in it 110 percent because I want someone to be in it with me 110 percent and all I can see now every time I'm with a, a client is what am I going to do what do I want what do I expect and if I if I give what I expect I know that I'm going to get it back so that's important to me and I think it's important to the client because I hear a lot of clients say, oh, now I got to start all over again. I don't want to trust nobody because every time I turn around, there's somebody new coming in. And that's hard. That's hard on the caregiver and it's hard on um, the patient, too. It's, it's a hard place. You know, um, the relationship that um, Deb forms with her patients, caregivers can be family members, caregivers can be um, you know, such as Deb, hired or professional. And I think one of the biggest struggles that we as uh, caregivers, uh, you know, a professional caregiver is, um, is burnout. And yeah. there's a lot of turnover in, in this work. And uh, I've spoke about my burnout and um, my burnout was not from from the patients that I worked with, right. that, that was not what burned me out. Because you could provide care and help them and give them medications or to make them comfortable and and things like that. What and ultimately burned me out was the family members that were there doing caregiving or people that were there day in and day out. When I would come as a nurse, I would be there for an hour maybe, and I would, you know, relieve them for that one hour of that feeling of responsibility. And we formed a bond and I was going all the time. And I, I really loved that caregiver because of what they were doing and how hard they were working and how much they were contributing to giving their all to the patient. And and after doing that for 12 years um, and seeing them at their lowest when the patient died, at the saddest they could be when the patient died. And, and my job as the nurse, I, I walked away and said, 
my job is done here. And I never, ever got to see that caregiver recuperate, get wow. better. I left them at their lowest point. And, you know, uh, in my belief, I, I know that the patient went to, you know, was better. They wow. were not in pain anymore. I don't, never knew that about the caregiver. I never wow. knew that they recovered because I never got to see them again. Right. So that was what burned me out. And I couldn't carry that many people with me for that many years any longer. Which is its own kind of precarious intimacy, right? Exactly. <laughs> Can I say something? I, I think that um, for me, what I've learned to do is if I stick with a client um, until the end, I, I like to take a break before I take on another client, because like she said, the burnout is something really seriously that um, we just take on. And I think my biggest challenge is taking that emotions home, as opposed to talking to somebody and trying to get it off of me, you know, carrying that weight. And I think that's what it needs to be more of an outlet, you know, but it, it's, it's challenging, but I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love it. I want to um, go back to you, Amalia, just before we open to um, the audience for questions, but I'd love to just hear you talk about the, the, what you learned from the experience of listening and learning and recording Deb's story. That's a, that's a, such a, a big question because I learned so much on so many different levels. And, you know, one thing that in relationship to go back to precarious intimacy, which is related to what I learned, one of the one of the greatest things I learned, which is that um, the the authors that I mentioned before, they they they're quick to point out, or they do when it, they do mention that um, they also use the term precarious intimacy to describe how, in spite of the fact that these bonds are fleeting despite their fragility, despite their fleetingness, that the fact that intimacies can form, especially in this case at the end of life, are testament to human beings' ability and, and will to find love um, in you know, unexpected ways at unexpected moments, right? That we crave human connection so much that in spite of everything, in spite of maybe not having lots of family or friends at the end that we're never alone. Right. And that's, that's what Deb taught me that, you know, at the last moment, even if, it, and, and, you know, that, that, that's what she's there for. She's there to say, you're not alone. Yeah. She's there to hold their hand when, you know, nobody else is. <sighs> and I'm getting emotional now too. <laughs> Cause it was so beautiful to hear to say these stories um and that um also she talked a lot about you know how when people are passing they'll see their loved ones coming to meet them at the end of their life and um you know and so even if in this world there's nobody left in the other world there might be and also Deb talks a lot about, you know, as we talked about letting go of unforgiveness. And so he, even if we have, even if we think we have no one, we have ourselves and therefore we're never alone. And so on all these different levels, we're never alone. And I think that, um, again, as I talk about, I, I'm, I feel like in our society right now, our, so many values are skewed. And I personally, I think all of us are searching for greater meaning and, and comfort in sort of knowing that that we're not alone not just at the end of our life but in our lives wow. and I think that that is really what Deb gave me was really that understanding um that um even if we're lonely we're never actually alone thanks to all of you for sharing your stories tonight. And I want to have you all be excited to be able to listen to Deb more on our website 
and also to know that um, Amalia's full record of of Deb that that um, that she wrote will be available soon, as will all of four of the other ethnographies. I said, when you listen to Deb, just bring your tissue box. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to mention if you want a taste of those stories and you can get to the Arizona State Museum in the exhibit, there are photographs of several caregivers and a QR code you can scan to just hear a taste of it, just a little bit of, of the ethnographies. And um, I do encourage everybody, if you're in Tucson and you haven't already or you want to see it again, to come see the exhibit. It closes on the 25th, uh, Saturday, the 25th is the last day to see it. I'd like to just thank Amalia for being there because she brought a lot out of me, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> she just, I mean, just the way she talks and listens, she just brought a lot out of me. She was like my counselor. <laughs> so I want to thank her, <laughs> really thank her. Oh, well, thank you thank so you. much. You were like mine, so we were co <laughs> Beautiful. It's a very beautiful ethnography that you'll read. Yeah. <laughs> and and also in, in the vein of, of telling stories and sharing stories and documenting them, as part of the exhibit, we have a story booth. And I put in the chat the link. You can record your own story or thoughts uh, from your home computer, or you can do it in the exhibit. And we'd really love people to share in that way. Um, Kimmy, you can talk a little bit about that, maybe. Yeah. So um, there's an opportunity for you to share your own experiences with caregiving. Um, those stories that we collect will be added to our archive on our website. So we're trying to just sort of collectively tell the story of, of what it means to, um, to be a, a caregiver and what, you, what people's experiences with grief and death are. We're part of this exhibit and our, our work at the Folklife Alliance is, is making a space for that and understanding the different ways that we, we mourn and the different ways that we grieve. So um, please share please share your story. So I'm going to turn to audience questions and I'm actually going to start with one that came up at the last uh, talk as well. Uh, if um, the person says, can Deborah and or Kim speak to any experience they have working with death midwives or also called death doulas? And people were wondering what's the difference between a death doula and a caregiver or a family member? Yeah. I, yeah. So, um, Death doulas are kind of um, newer. I mean, not the official title, I guess. I think that there probably have always been some people, maybe in a community that have served in this role. Um, doulas, we know, are often somebody that's there for birth. Um, and these are people that are there for the other end of life, right? For not for coming into this world, but for leaving this world. And um, these are people that are not connected to any organization per se. Um, they are maybe in their own organization, but they are um, somebody that can be there for you um, as a person that can help you exit this world. And it's not you know, it's like the Hemlock Society or anything like that, or any, um, you know, Death with Dignity or um, some of the other organizations that are assisted, uh, assisting death. Um, they're just there to help you and, and do things that may also help you, like, uh, get things in order, your wishes, those kind of things. So death doulas um are, are pretty new. We had one recently at the end of life care partnership with us who was starting um, to bring the death doulas together into an organized fashion so that you could actually reach out to them and, and, and not have to look for very, you know, all over the place for a death doula if you needed one. So there's a question here, um, a couple of questions. I'm going to combine them. Um, one is from Yusuf, what are some things you have done to relieve stress or burnout in healthcare, um, as that can sometimes take a toll? And then another similar question of, um, from Dee, uh, I'm wondering how caregivers protect themselves emotionally from becoming too attached to the dying person. Are there any tricks of the trade? So kind of two-part question, what do you do for self-care? Um, to take care of yourself and then how do you uh, deal with the emotional attachment 
for me, my self-care, um, by me being a therapist by trade, um, I talk to other therapists. Um, I talk to other people um, without mentioning the client's name, but I talk to them about the situation I'm going to so that I can have that release because sometimes it's hard to separate because I'm there four days a week, 12 hour shifts. So it's kind of hard sometimes to, to separate myself from the situation. So I make sure that I have someone that I can always talk to, someone I can always confide in, somebody that don't mind me crying, <laughs> don't mind me laughing and crying and, and just somebody that, that listens to me. I think that's more important to me. That's my release. I would definitely agree with that. Um, I tried, you know, good diet, exercise, all of those things. And they're wonderful. But um, if you don't have somebody that's willing to listen, and it's hard as a caregiver, because you don't want to go home to your family. And, yeah. you know, it's not something you talk about at the dinner table. It's not something, um, you know, that everybody wants to talk about. It's uncomfortable to some people. So you have to find other people who are interested in helping, not helping you, but it helps them too. So you can both share. Right. Um, and for me, the other part, which I didn't take care of myself and I didn't do, it was closure. Um, you know, really seeking as much closure as you could get. Um, you know, whether it was closure with the family by closure going to a funeral and I it's not possible always to go to all the services that when we are hospice nurses I mean it, you, you'd be going to the funeral a funeral all the time and family members invite you um, so you have to figure out some sort of ritualistic closure that helps you um, whatever that is that works for you um, to find that uh, closure and it can be your own little you know ritual whether it's you know I, one of the things <laughs> people would do is it was give me you know something from their you know garden or something and and I have that at home a lot of those little things that I got from their garden and some of them are pebbles some of them are you know they're just various things but that was a kind of closure helpful to me, um, to carry those people with me in some sort of tangible item. And I found that to be very helpful. There's a question here from um, Christine, kind of along these lines, um, who says that she's learned a lot during this webinar. And Deborah, you mentioned that you write. Could you share more about your practice of writing? For example, how does it benefit you and how does it benefit, how does it benefit your caregiving practice? It benefits me because it lets me see what I'm doing. And I think that's more important than anything is to know how I'm feeling at the time, how I deal with my emotions. Um, and the next time I look at it again and see that sometimes there's difference, but I get to know more of me. I get to know how to change. Sometimes I get to know how, what not to say, what to say, um, and how to deal with people. So it helps me both ways. It helps me to be stable, it helps me to be, you know, to know that everybody's not the same, but it helps me to grow. It's my growth. And every time I go back and read how I was feeling and how did I let it go and when did I let it go? And I think prayer is the most thing, uh, vital thing for me is that I have to have a prayerful life. I have to keep praying all the time so I can give God that relief instead of me trying to keep it on myself. I, I have a question. Um, how does if somebody is looking for a caregiver for a family member, what should they be asking and looking for? How do you start to find somebody that you can trust and that will be good with your family? I think that, yeah, that's a good one because everybody, not everybody fits into the family. Not everybody fits into a particular job. But I think that um, coming out and meeting them, talking to them, and I think sometimes um, if, if they have family, family sit back and let them talk to the client. And a lot of times, because they're very sensitive, they're, they know if you care or not, and they know if they want you around or not. And, and you have to have empathy, no matter who you are. You just have to have that empathy, that patience, that understanding, 
and you just have to take one day at a time. So I think a good caregiver is one that has empathy, one who listens, not always trying to put your will into somebody else's life, but listen and, and watch how they uh, operate with the client. Watch how they, um, like I said before, it, it, what they don't say. Can you pick up what they're not saying? You know, and how do they get along with the family? So that that's a big one. Thank and you. I think word of mouth, finding a good one is word of mouth a lot. You know, word of mouth, um, somebody who met somebody, who knew somebody. Um, I think that's how I, I got a lot of my clients was through word of mouth. You know, go to them. She, you know, she's that type and she's this type. I didn't take every case because it, it didn't fit me. But the ones that I did take, I knew that they fit me. There's a question here for Amalia, but um, I'll read it. But I think it's a, it's thinking that Amalia is a caregiver, but maybe she can answer it anyway. Um, can you talk a bit more about your movement, about movement with your experience as a caregiver? Um, but I don't know if that applies since you're not a caregiver, but I don't know if there's a way you want to talk about movement and your experience with um, recording Deb's story. Yeah, yes. No, yes. I'm not actually... Um... I'm, I'm, I'm not a caregiver, um, but I can talk about kind of my, my interest in that. Um, actually, I, when I first started this project, I was also interviewing um, a dancer who runs a dance company that works with people of different abilities. And um, some of those people, um, are are only able to move, you know, a, a, a finger. Some are only able to move their head. Um, and so what she talked about and helped me to think a lot about was finding the meaning and movement and beauty in just a, a small little um a small little movement. And then in talking to Deb, realizing how much more power, how much loudly, how much more loudly and big that movement seems when the person is otherwise incapacitated. And Deb talked a lot and, and she can talk much more about this than I can, but um, you know, even just, I think she, I remember her saying, you know, when, when one client would just let the right leg fall, it meant the left one hurt. Mm -hmm. um, or the nuances of the squeeze of a hand, even like, a, a slight squeeze meant, you know, yes. A tight squeeze meant yes, definitely, you know. <laughs> and in and, and it was typically one story she was telling me about um, someone who was waiting for their relative, and and they wouldn't pass. And it was like, are you waiting for so for your brother? Light squeeze. Are you waiting for your, um, I don't know, cousin light squeeze? Are you waiting for your, I think it was daughter or son. And it was, yeah. yes, yes. And all of that was just communicated with this sort of different nuances of movement and, and pressure. But I don't know, Deb, maybe you can talk way more about that than I can. Those were just some highlights I remember that you talked about. Um, yeah, I think that goes back to um, when a person can't speak, um, you can always find ways to communicate with them. And that that was so true that when I asked them who they was waiting for and how to squeeze my hand. And it was amazing because I wasn't trained to do that. I, it came to me. I wasn't trained how to do that, but it just came to me and it, it, it works. You know, it really, really works. Yeah. And I remember you also telling me the story about the woman who used to like mysteries, but then oh. all of a sudden... <laughs> go ahead you can tell it <laughs> no I mean yeah, just like and how and you were flipping channels and all of a sudden you know and she was not verbal really verbal but all of a sudden you know you put on the cartoons and she started hysterically laughing mm -hmm. <laughs> and that that again that goes back to um trying to find ways to communicate with people that really don't communicate verbally and you was right I was just changing the channels and I kept looking at her and all of a sudden she started laughing I'm like let me go back and I said oh you like this and you know and then I found out things that she liked without even you know question her it was just her emotions and the way that she acted and how she got excited so I mean it's so many ways to communicate with people, you know, non-verbal people. So and I love it because I'm learning how to do things that I never could do before. So, yeah. And that's another thing that surfaced in your ethnography and several others, too, is just the role of humor. In <laughs> yeah. 
I've just learned so much. So much. I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask each of you um, in closing um, how this work, whether as a caregiver at end of life or um, uh, a caregiver and a researcher and uh, a teacher and an ethnographer, how this work of looking um, closely at end of life care or doing it. Uh, for me, yes, it has changed the way I live. It changes the way I think. I'm, ca I'm more careful. Um, I'm very, very careful when it comes to people's emotions, when it comes to their wishes, when it comes to their desire, it makes me very, very sensitive. And I think that's, that's grown, that was something that I haven't had before. So I think that every time that um, I learn more about a client or a patient and that sensitivity, it helps me to develop and I have really changed. I'm not the person that I was. I, I don't, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not the person that I was when I first started in this field, but I know that I can't put myself out there with everybody, but it's just like, I just want to keep doing it. You know, I just want to keep doing it. And it, it's, it just teaches me who I am. It teaches me what I want and my desires, you know, as well as somebody else's desire. And it gives me a joy to see somebody happy and to see somebody in peace, you know, and to know that they left peacefully so yeah, I've changed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I think along those lines, you know, after being with so many people over all those years that have died, never once did I ever hear anybody say, oh, I wish I had, you know, that gotten, you know, worked harder. I wish yeah. I made more money. I wish, you know, I wish I had gotten a, you know, a better job or a promotion. It was always, I wish I had spent more time with my family or, you know, I had taken that trip um, and explored that, that hobby that I never got around to. Um, and those were the things that people said consistently. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that has changed me or, you know, really formulated my life with, um, you know, choices I make along the way. You know, as we, as we move forward in life, you're constantly faced with directional choices of what do I want to do and what don't I want to do. And so I, I reflect on that all the time so kind of looking from the end forward you know when I'm that person laying there at the end you know like Deb said who do uh, paying it forward you know yeah. what what is it I want around me and what do I want do I want to have any regrets um do I want to say oh I wish I had taken you know not worked until I was 80 because mm -hmm. I didn't do the things I wanted to, you know? So um, that's how it's changed me. Amalia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I would just echo that. Um, obviously I'm not in the work on a, on a um, daily level, but um, I working with Deb, I think really gave me so much insight into um, into um, really, again, what to value, um, how to prioritize. And I think there are so many people around my age who are still really caught in the rat race and the, the, um, the, the values I think that we are taught to sort of have and, and um, the things that we're, we are taught to focus on um, and to judge ourselves by really don't matter in the end. And, um, you know, so I think that I have actually tried to pay forward in a way because I, I know so many people who have this angst because we're told we should have a certain thing at a certain age. And, um, and so I've been just trying to actually share some of Deb's wisdoms with them. And, 
And that's how, even though I don't work with, um, with people at the end of life, I, I work with people who are at the end of their rope sometimes. <laughs> same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know so I try to bring some of that 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 wisdom and that humor that that Deb gave me you know and Amal- Amalia I am so excited to hear about your dance um thoughts because mm-hmm. to me you know not caring if I stand out in the middle of the street and dance <laughs> I, I mean, I, I reflect on, on what's important. Now, it also has to do with age, because when you're younger and you stand out in the middle of the street and you dance, you know, they put you in a facility. But you know, <laughs> when you're older, they go, oh, poor thing. Look at him. So she's so glad she can still dance, you know. So um, it's all it, it, it's all relative. But I love the idea that you can dance through the end of life. and that whole concept. So thank you for sharing that. Cause I, I will, I will definitely look for your ethnography on, on that as you develop it. Thanks to all of you, um, Kim and Deborah and Amalia. Thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your wisdom and your experience and your perspective. Um, it was really wonderful to be with you. And just a shout out to Adam Cooper Teran, who's here behind the scenes and he's going to be, um, working with the video and making it, um, putting it online and fixing it up and making it nice. And then another thank you to um, Darlene Lizarraga, who is also on the back end doing some tech and emailing and setting up the webinar. So thank you to both of you. And thanks to Lisa and the Arizona State Museum for hosting us. And one more thank you to Arizona Humanities for supporting these programs that we're doing. and to the Arizona End of Life Care Partnership who's helped support some of the programming as well. So um, with that, I wanna thank Kimmy for all her partnership and shared work on the exhibit and on these programs um, as we continue to go forward. And I wanna remind everyone that you will receive a link to an evaluation. And if you don't mind filling it out, we do look at them and read them and share them among us. So. Um, Thank you so much. In the chat was a link to sharing your stories. If you didn't catch that, it's on our website under the page for the exhibit as well. So thank you, everybody. We'll see you on the 21st for our next talk. Thank you. Thank you.